Anthony and Henry are going to talk about the Ultimate Micro PFU project. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, coffee, yes. Just come upstairs. One thirty-three. We have it for you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to go briefly over what the Universal PSU kit is all about, and um, Henry will take over on the very, very juicy details about it. Um, basically, how and why? Um, I guess first of all, why? Uh, I touched upon it briefly on Wednesday, um, but. To go back and give you a little history, we were trying to get back together into this, and we needed some known good starting points. And we found that when we're trying to develop something, we're having little issues, weird issues, things that were very random. Why does a board that we develop work great in this system, but OK, now I take it over to my system, it's not working. Is it the system? What is it? Something wrong with the ground? Is something wrong with my, my power company? W what's happening? And uh, we found the common denominator was that, believe it or not, you know, they live way past their life expectancies, the original power supplies. So we said, you know, we may have to change those out. So after, to only fix the problem was, all right, let's grab a bunch of them, okay? And we got a bunch and we found a few good supplies, re recapped them, which is really not the way to fix the problem. But it was our best method of trying to push forward some projects. And then we also had the, well, we do sell the little power. But an inherent issue with that is that it actually needs a draw. And it's not a constant power that's fed out. So it, it, it's an issue because with the little power, you're hooking up originally a mini box 200 watt PSU. That's what we were recommending. And that was the best thing available at that time. Recently, uh, Minibox came out with something else that you could hook up to it. And it's, it's a little better. But we've also uh, 90%, 90%. But it's not 100%. And it does not, it's not flawless. So we still needed something to get us over so we have a known good starting point. We know our systems are good. So when we're producing something for the community, we know at least it's working, and then we could possibly help someone else out that may not have a good, known good starting point. And uh, as these devices age, we want to make sure we continue the lifespan on them. So that's kind of the reason how and why we did this. So we said we have to get something that's going to be a direct replacement and a drop-in. And that wasn't easy to find, I could tell you that much. And there was a lot of work involved. And you can see, take a look at the manual. It's not just two pages. So it's a lot of work putting that. So that's kind of the reason why. Um, and I'm going to let him take over, and that is Henry. And he's going to go over all the juicy details. So, so now you have an idea why. All right? And uh, if you are experiencing weird issues, crashes, uh, you know, it may not be that card. It probably is your power supply. Maybe on its way out, because they're only rated for maybe 10 years. And this, we all know, is what the GS is 22 now. and. Um, Two E, two plus. You know, they're a little bit older too. So, all right, Henry, take over. Thank you, Mr. Martino. You got it. And so, <laughs> damn boys. <laughs> okay, welcome to the Ultimate Micro Power Supply session here. I'm Henry from Reactive Micro, and we're going to discuss some of the power supply issues and basically how this project came about. For everybody knows, PSU stands for Power Supply Unit. How and why it's universal is the Input AC voltage is universal. It can be used throughout the world internationally. And the PCB itself mounts internally in your Apple II power supply enclosure. This is your average Apple II power supply enclosure. It's a metal case. This one was some, a project that actually was started back in 2005. And we physically gutted the old Apple power supply and I would put in an ATXI power supply, a U2 server power supply from the day. And as man mentioned in the last KFest, we had kind of revisited these projects and had it in, work, in the work so we could have a known good starting point. 
we're having a lot of inconsistencies with the memory card project and some of the, the Pi project and stuff. We wanted to make sure it wasn't just a, a GS motherboard. It wasn't a flaky 2E or 2 Plus we were playing with or bad RAM. It ended up being a power supply that was causing a lot of the trouble. Same with uh, transwarp upgrades. We'd have people say, oh, we got a transwarp in, and that's yeah, running fine at 16 megahertz. We send it back. I don't know. I can't get it past 14. Like, yeah, that's odd. It's working fine in my system. These coins KGSP at that point. Yes, we need a KGSP, a known, known good starting point. Known good starting point. It took a while to get there. It, yes, it did. So I get this question a lot. When do you need a new power supply? A few people have always asked this. You know, I, how can I tell when I need a new power supply? My, after all, my Apple II is working fine. It turns on, it goes beep. Now, good question. Now, although I thought the answer would be kind of obvious. It's been 30 plus years that your old PSU has been working, has been doing stuff. Uh, kind of, you need a new one. It, it's time. How much more do you want or expect from a piece of equipment that was only designed to last a few years at the most? Do you really believe that Apple designed the power supply to really last as long as it has? Yeah. I get this a lot. Uh, I'm going to replace some caps on my power supply. It, it's not really the parts that are needed. It's good. It, it's a piece of it. It's, uh, it's kind of like having a car fire and putting new tires on your car, though. Like, it's not really going to help you a whole lot. Uh, the main parts are the diodes and the, the transistors, of course, are doing the actual work. Uh, the, the transformer itself is the engine. Uh, the resistors, however, and a lot of the power supplies are undersized and they get very hot. And this is a good example of you know, some capacitors, but these resistors have gotten so hot they've actually discolored and in some cases will burn the fiberglass PCB under them. And I left a couple props out in front of Quinn and Carl there, if anybody actually wants to see the units up close, you could see on the front and the back, you could see some of the burning that actually occurs in multiple places. These parts get very, very hot. Again, Apple really didn't design them to last 30 years. They designed them to last you know, within the warranty period, maybe two years at most. <clears throat> So the question becomes, do you really think overheating parts for 30 plus years is fine? Eh, yeah. The resistors themselves are like 5% tolerance. Sometimes some of the capacitors are 10% tolerance parts. And they will change with heat, and especially over time. Now, but I've recapped my power supply. Eh, maybe you've replaced a couple of the critical parts. Well, this is better, of course. But sorry to say you still need a new power supply. The heart of the power supply is a step-down transformer. You'll see a big square thing in the middle of the boards there. Did you replace this? I know you couldn't have because they don't make them anymore, and they haven't for quite a few years, about 30. And even if you got one, it's old stock. And the problem is the transformer wires, the copper wires themselves, are coated with a very thin insulating coating. And after years, this oxidizes. It wears from heating up and cooling down, and little cracks can form. And then a lot of the major failures we end up seeing is that the transformer itself shorts out internally. And this leads to uh, sometimes not a major failure, sometimes a catastrophic failure. And it can send hundreds of volts through your Apple II. It might only be for a millisecond, might, enough, might not be enough to actually physically damage it at the time, but it's overstressing parts and potentially causing things to fail sooner. Won't be today, might not be in a year, but eventually it's going to stress them out and, and lead them to burn out. Well, I get a lot of, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of stuff. Uh, the way the, the power supplies can fail, uh, you, you definitely want to replace them. You don't want the power, the transformers themselves to go. A lot of times the diodes will go and you'll see one of the power supplies particularly has a bad diode on it. And it's a little hard to tell it's actually bad. But you put it on and man, your 2E will do really crazy stuff. You really want to be a little proactive. Do you uh, wait for your tires to blow out and possibly cause an accident or do you replace them when the wear indicator shows? 
Show of hands here who waits for your tires to blow out, right? Nobody, right? Oh, okay, well, one person, good. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, AAA, good. You really want to be proactive. You don't want to wait for your power supply to fail. It's 30 years old in most cases. How much more do you really want or expect from this poor little piece of machinery? <clears throat> and when it fails, it can take a lot of other devices with it. To kind of illustrate the problem, we'll use cars as an analogy here. Do you wait for your engine to seize? Do you wait for your tires to fall off before you fix the problem? No, you change your oil, you put new tires on your car. It's a little more cost effective that way. There are extreme examples, of course. If people are doing the exact thing with your Apple II when you're not replacing the power supply. You're just waiting for disaster. The best case scenario is something minor fails and the power supply blows out. It turns itself off. That's kind of what it's designed to do with some of the fail safes, but they don't always work. They're old as well. <clears throat> In this case, it's uh, usually a little better if any damage occurs. It's uh, to your peripheral cards and things like that. Uh, Apple II usually will survive. GS is a little more sensitive to this kind of stuff. Unfortunately, it, it gets worse from there. Uh, perhaps, as I said, maybe 100 volts just ran for you through your motherboard. Uh, not long, a quarter of a millisecond or so, but it's enough to stress things out, and they become more and more in intermittently prone to failure. Uh, we've seen a lot of transwarps come in with that kind of damage. Oh, it works for 10 minutes and stops. I don't know why. It was fine. Did your power supply go? Yeah, it blew up last year. Oh, geez. Yeah, okay. Well, let's start diagnosing and trying to fix it, which is a lot of hours of time and relatively costly. Sometimes the damage is not enough to physically show or be a fire or something, but ICs generally will suffer some kind of trauma that isn't observable. Oh, I'm on the wrong screen. Ah. <clears throat> the simplest Apple power supply has about 50 parts. You see those, a lot of them have a lot more. Any one could fail just due to age alone, but they're heating up, they're overstressed, they're 30 years old, 25 years old. <clears throat> Something as simple as a capacitor could fail, and that could lead to just noise on the system and cause intermittent failures and lockups as well. It also leads to unregulated voltage, unfiltered noise. <clears throat> Worst case, a major component fails. Again, it leads to fires, shorts, <clears throat> actually destroys things, takes things with it. Unfortunately, there's little hope to resurrect damage on a system that's had a major catastrophic failure. You get a few calls a year. <clears throat> People send in systems that literally have traces burned off the board and holes burned in them as well. <clears throat> <clears throat> Some people have moved on to ATX power supplies. We had a little power as well. Anthony had mentioned that a little bit before. But these are some of the pitfalls. As I mentioned before, the original power supply project back in 2005 was ATX. These ATX power supplies have something called a minimum value. It's a manufacturer's requirement for a minimum load that has to be applied to the power supply in order for it to work correctly. It's just how they're designed. They also have unused voltages in the Apple itself. So you put an ATX in the, in the system, <clears throat> the 3.3 line isn't being used. The 5 volt front side bus connector isn't used. A lot of I, a, uh, ATX and ATX high power supplies need to have these outputs used in order to work correctly. <clears throat> Not meeting these values, the minimum I.O. values can cause something as simple as reduced power or voltage regulation or even the power supply not turning on. I'm sure we've all just kind of plugged the power supply in, hit an ATX, tried to turn it on, it does nothing. Some of the older power supplies, it will just come on and work. It's just the way the ATX itself is designed and a lot of its safety features. <clears throat> uh, sometimes not meeting these I.O. minimum values, the power supply will work, but it will give wild swings in voltages, sometimes in power itself, and is far beyond what they're designed or its normal limit. It needs to have these minimum values met. <clears throat> Issues themselves can and will be inconsistent. We've run into a lot of problems when working on equipment where that worked one minute, why is it not working now? And they're affected by temperature, humidity, the actual AC power itself we put into them. And sometimes the, <clears throat> the voltage itself and the loads we've put on it 
could be a half an amp, and then we go to a full amp, it's a whole other issue was encountered. We need to meet five amps. I mean, it's almost impossible to pull five amps out of an Apple II. <clears throat> Some people have said, oh, I use an ATX, I don't get any issues. I've checked it a couple times. It's good. Well, when is it good? After five seconds you took a reading, or is maybe an hour or 10 minutes in? How long? What were the conditions? What were the input power? What loads did you have on it? Again, all this affects the operability and output and consistency of the ATX. Issues can and will happen. It's all intermittent, unfortunately. There's no set scenario unless the power supply just doesn't turn on. That's the most consistent thing. <clears throat> the Apple II is like a buggy. It's very dependable. It's easy to repair, it's low cost, it's easy to understand, it's easy to add to, it's very utilitarian. The power supply itself, it only requires is a very small work animal, much like a mule or a pack horse. It's all this device needs in order to operate. <clears throat> Your average ATX power supply, it's like one to 300 watts, it's huge. It, you could add a rocket to the engine with afterburners and go into space with it, but do you really need it? And this is kind of the question here. And you can do it, but I mean, you start to run into some new issues. When is too much too much? It's best to match the tool to the job. You wouldn't want to use a chainsaw to whittle a tooth toothpick, and you don't want to use a pen knife to cut down a 200-year-old tree either. There's a certain match that's best to use. The power supply itself in the universal power supply kit is 63 watts, maximum output. It's only a couple amps on each line. That's all the Apple II ever needs, and it never even draws nearly as much as that. <clears throat> it's also a lot newer design. It's designed to last a lot longer. There's a lot less heat, and they have a lot better built-in protections than the original power supplies. The kit itself is also insanely easy to install, coined by Chris. It takes about 15 minutes. There's no modifications to your enclosure or your chassis. And it's good for at least another 10 years of use. I'd recommend every 10 years, regardless of how much you've had it on five minutes or, or 10 years straight, replace the power supply. It's just good insurance. They're relatively inexpensive. It's about 10 bucks a year for a little peace of mind. These are also medical grade power supplies. These are used at heart and lung machines and all kinds of monitors. They're meant to take abuse. They're meant to operate in heavy humidity. They're meant to operate outside in the, the environments of uh, ambulances and things like that. This power supply is also a minimum of 10 years old. This design is actually closer to 12 now. And it's in revision Q to give you an idea how old and how well designed this power supply is. All the issues have been worked out. In closing, Everyone needs to replace their power supply. You should do so every so 10 years or so. And if you have problems, it's one of the least, uh, if you've replaced it, it's one of the least problems you'll have. As far as diagnosis, you'll be able to say, okay, power supply is not going to be the problem. I've got another issue. Then you can contact us to have it fixed. So with the project, we, some of the people have helped us here. There's John Morris, Chris Torrance, of course, with his videos. and. Joe Strosnyder, doing a few videos as well. Dave Ramsey, Herbert Fung, he's got uh, an inner drive here if people want to see the actual power supply mounted. We're going to update our manual with that as well. Some more pictures and actual, we might even do a video of it and how to install it. Uh, everyone, of course, I forgot to mention on the list, there's a few others as well. The Apple II community, you guys are actually showing up in Waz for making the two. And of course, these guys, Andy and all of them, who help run the sessions and keep everything moving along here. Thanks. Finished early. Yay. Any questions? Any questions? Go ahead. Um, does it require, like, you to know how to solder to put this thing together? Or what sort of specific skills are required to put the kit together and get it up and running in your Apple? The <laughs> skills are literally. If you can operate a screwdriver and a pair of wire snips, that's about it. And you'd have to unscrew the actual enclosure from your Apple II. But the power supply just has four little holes. You'll see the screws there, and they just mount onto the standoffs. Very simple. 
The board itself has all these little holes. It looks like I shot it with a shotgun. But it's meant to fit in all the different enclosures. Each enclosure, there's about eight of them, have different mounting points. There's a lot of little odds and ends. Uh, they're nice and colorful. The idea is that when you go into your power supply, you will see over here some power connectors, and we got lines and everything. And you'll be able to actually use a lot of the connectors involved. And again, it's very easy. You only need one or two of them. But we include everything to cover all the different enclosures themselves. We include a couple different types of splices if you need to actually splice a piece of the wire. If your power supply leads themselves, the power lines are too short, the AC lines, you're actually able to use these connectors in different ways. These are mainly for the Apple III, although you can use the wire themselves to extend, just cut it and use it. The idea is you can buy one kit and it covers everything you have. You don't have to worry. If you've got pliers and you want to use the real quicky crimp splices, you can. We include Wago splices. You just flip a little lever. So if you have a lot of tools, great. If you have a little tools, great. And Yes? Yeah, as Chris pointed out, basically, as long as you got a screwdriver, you're pretty much good. <laughs> if you want to reuse your existing power cable, the DC connection cable, you can. We also sell a connection cable if you just don't feel like wiring up. There's six wires you'll have to connect over here using a screwdriver to punch them down. Again, in the manual, it's all laid out. It's very easy. If you, you don't want to, you just want to push on one connector, you're done. You buy the cable. Yes? Yes, the orders will be delivered in about two hours, right about after dinner in time for Solderfest. Uh, Auntie and I will be running around. I believe Solderfest is down here. So we'll be running around giving you guys a hand with it. We'll have some tools as well. If it takes you 15 minutes to do this, I'd be surprised. I think Chris did it in like six. <laughs> he was very disappointed he didn't have more material for his video. <laughs> yes? Unfortunately, no, although we're looking into that. I'm looking into Amigas as well. What I've learned here, again, apples are very utilitarian, very basic. The enclosures, the way they design them are very simple. So I'm hoping to kind of go out and spread a little love into some of the other communities. They definitely are needed, though, yes. Yes? Are there some parts Well, the question is, uh, are, are all power supplies created equal? Are all Apple enclosures created equal? No, they're not. There are some that are a nightmare to get into. Some of the early power supplies were riveted shut, so you have to drill the rivets. If you take a look at the install manual, you can kind of check your part number and go, oh, I've got this one. I'm going to need a drill bit. I wouldn't recommend upgrading those. They're kind of really collector's items. I'd tell you to put them on a shelf, go get an old 2E or GS power supply. They're all over the place. They're, they're very easy to come by for 10 or 20 bucks. In fact, I think James Littlejohn is selling some this year as well and probably have a whole crate of them out at the Vendor Fair or Solder Fest, even for 20, 25 bucks or something. Uh, some of the... Easy to find a dead one. Yes, it's very easy. I think there were half a dozen out at the, the giveaway as well. It's very easy to find a dead power supply and resurrect it. Uh, if you want to save yourself a couple bucks, use the cable, snip the cable off and use that at least. Um, the stamped uh, steel one, there's a, an actual 10126 steel enclosure. That's not a, a clam style, it's, it's two L shapes that are kind of press fitted together. <clears throat> and although there's a screw in it, uh, they use like a press clip. And that takes a good five minutes to kind of figure out how to get into it without bending it all to hell. So yeah, not all power supply enclosures are created equal. Yes. Uh, Stuart and I did one of his yesterday that were, or for Tom, uh, yesterday that were a steel enclosure. And even Stuart was like, oh my god, I can't get into this. And he's hammering and beating on. We finally got it, but it took a good five minutes. So no, not in all enclosures are created equal. The best one is probably the aluminum enclosures with the screws. It comes apart in two seconds. <clears throat> Any other questions? Comments? Oh, yes. So the old, uh, <clears throat> The Apple IIs themselves draw a, anywhere from like 8 to 15 watts. And that 
Yeah, and that includes like your average disk drive two controller and hooked up with a monitor turned on and all that. They don't draw very much at all. <clears throat> now sometimes guys will put crazy amounts of RAM and stuff. If you had a system that got 25 watts, I'd be totally amazed. Even a, a transwarp in there with Herbert Fung runs half a dozen microdrive turbos in a system and that I don't even think draws 25 watts. They're very, very efficient. We're talking chips that draw milliamps each and you've got a hundred of them in the system, it's nothing at all. So when somebody puts an ATX power supply, it's even 150 watts. I'm like, what are you doing? You can weld with that. You don't want to really put this monster in your apple. It's not the right tool for the job. Yes? What's the overhead on making sure the overhead is supply? Overhead as far as? Uh, as far as the overhead or the efficiency of the power supply, <clears throat> I believe the original Apple power supplies range from like 75, 78 on up to maybe like 82, 85 maybe at the ceiling. It's a high efficiency power supply. It depends the frequency of the AC and the actual voltage of the AC, but it can be as efficient, I believe, as 96 or 95 percent. So, <clears throat> it's you're not going to spend that much more a year, or save that much more a year, but it's a lot less heat coming out of this power supply. You're not losing it in the form of 10 or 15 watts of thermal energy. So as far as if you're concerned with heat or lack of fan, <clears throat> I know some people are, then this is definitely a good upgrade as well. <clears throat> yes? Regulated, yeah. Yeah, ATXs are generally, the, the comment from Stuart was is that the ATX power supplies would generally have a recommended sweet spot. <clears throat> when you use them, they're, they're meant to kind of go with a certain motherboard or set of motherboards or a server. <clears throat> they're meant to draw a certain uh, quantity of amps, basically. They're meant to dissipate a certain amount of energy. And the power supply itself will then operate correctly. It'll be more efficient. It'll run cooler. When you draw its bare minimums, it could be wildly inefficient, like 20% off efficiency. It's all heat. It's trying to keep up with this little teeny output, which it, it's not designed to need. And vice versa, if you run them in too big of a system and they're constantly outputting power, they overheat as well. They have this sweet spot. It's about 20 to 30% of their output usually. They kind of laugh at gamers that put like 800 watt power supplies in their system and they're, they're burning up like 100, 200 watts. It's like you're, you're beating up your power supplies for no reason. <coughs> Stuart mentioned that the supply manufacturers tend to hype up their claims. So yeah, it might be 800 watts, but it's for a quarter of a millisecond. You know, under the right conditions, it'll do it. The second you try and stress them out anyway, or low, again, if you don't meet those requirements, it may operate, but not very long. <clears throat> this, as I said, is a medical grade power supply. It will go up to 63 watts and stay there forever. Won't do 65, I know. <laughs> it'll burn it right up, but it will do 65 all day long. It gets hot. That's multiple amps. That's five, four amps on the five volt line and six amps on the, the 12 volt line. You, you, there's no Apple II in the world that draws. I don't care if you put 20 floppy drives on it. It, it can't draw that kind of power. So it, there's a nice sweet spot in the Apple II. It's about 15 watts. And this power supply is not even warm to the touch at that point. In fact, I, I was hoping that Chris would actually measure it with a thermometer. I couldn't get it above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, in a lot of cases, enough to, to 
darken the motherboard on the power supply. So Yeah, heavily loaded system. I don't get this power supply above 115 degrees in a heavily loaded system, 115 degrees Fahrenheit for those in the <laughs> internet. Um, the actual power supply in the Apple, I think, starts like 120 degrees, and depends on what you add. To, to actually burn and darken the fiberglass takes about 170 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's how hot those little resistors are running. Yeah, so, and that heat goes somewhere. And they're very small, very true, but you feel that case and you go, wow, that power supply, if you had it on for an hour or two, is warm. It's a lot more than 100 degrees. So you can imagine those components inside are just cooking next to those little heaters. So, yes? So how long do you expect these types of products to last five, six years? Well, they don't know. I asked the company themselves, I said, what's the oldest power supply you got? And they, they're still in use. They're, the oldest one they know of is about 12 years old. That's when they've actually released them, uh, back in 2004, 2005. They're still running. They, they rate them. The warranty's for three years. We offer two, but we'll honor it longer, although I, I can't, unless being struck by lightning, I can't imagine there's going to be any issues with them. And the company themselves can fix them, although they're cheap enough, and they're just going to come down in the coming years. Yeah, exactly. So it, I'm guaranteeing almost 10 years. I mean, if you left it on straight, and some of these monitor devices that they use in hospitals and ambulances are left on straight. So it, it, they're still going. Yeah, so it, I guarantee this is going to last at least 10 years. So it's interesting you mentioned that uh, the cost of the grade, uh, because I've seen some before uh, in that format. So I'm wondering if there's this equipment that they no longer make and anybody can just take the cost of it. Um, the, the question is about the form factor and the, the, the power supply itself. Um, they've designed the power supply to be very compact. It was just a fluke that it actually fit in the Apple and was the correct size. Uh, again, it was meant for portable equipment and things that they could, they're in the field, they need to bring a, a defibrillator to someone. They're going to use. No, I understand. Like, like, I bought a bunch of EOS power supplies. <coughs> Third world countries? Where do you think all our old equipment winds up? It's still good, but if you want to see a 20-year-old heart lung machine next to you, I know I don't. <laughs> so especially with the prices I pay for insurance. I think, I think medical grade usually refers to uh, flame resistance that is not unlikely to make a spark or a flame, um, and yeah. very good line isolation. Yeah, so there's no sense. leakage to the AC line. Yeah, that makes sense. It's because very clean, it yes. Yeah, explosive gases, oxygen, you dentist's know, office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're also very good around high humidity areas. Sometimes things will condensate, and these will not arc. They won't brown out. They won't do odd things. I mean, unless you submerge a thing in water, but it's good up to humidity of like 92% or something, and condensation of dripping off the thing, and you can still touch it. it, it you'll kind of see where it says, don't touch, a warning, don't, don't stick your tongue on here. Um, <laughs> You can, and you won't get shocked. I tell people wait about 10 seconds before turning it off, but if you touch it, you're not going to get shocked. Don't touch them, please, but don't lick them. yeah, don't lick them. <laughs> don't stand in your bare feet holding copper you know, faucet, trying to upgrade your power supply and turn it on and use it. But they're very, very safe. Any other questions? Good. Thank you.